Thank you, Tracy. Good morning, Grace Church. And we thank you for coming and being with us today. A special welcome to our friends from In His Steps Ministry. Guys, good to see you. Thanks for coming and being with us today. If you are new, we hope that you've been already warmly welcomed. We have a packet that tells a little bit about Grace Church, and it has a Connect card and a pen. You can fill the Connect card out, put it in one of the boxes at the back of the sanctuary, and that way we can begin to communicate and, and become family together. Is anybody here to see, uh, this morning like uh, one of those packets? Our ushers will bring that to you. Okay, great. We also want to make sure that everybody has a copy of the notes for our study this morning in First Thessalonians. Anybody need a, a copy of the notes or a copy of the Bible? We'd love to bring either or both of those to you as well. Okay. And then on the uh, first page on the bottom, we always want to bring your attention to events that are taking place uh, as part of the family. And uh, we want to let you know that particularly next Sunday, two o'clock, we'll be gathering to celebrate the life and homegoing of our brother, Roger Boisel. And you're all in Warmly uh, invited to that. Speaking of memorials, I am so proud of Grace Community Church. Yesterday we joined together to celebrate the life and home going of our dear brother Gene Oxy. And uh, Barbara is uh, with us this morning uh, in worship. And so a warm welcome to, uh, to Barbara. I think, I don't, Barbara, where are you? There you are. Hi, sweetheart. Um, and uh, we had a full house. We had every seat packed and we brought in extra chairs. And it was just a testimony to uh, the life and the quality of life lived by Gene. And whenever you say Gene, you got to include Barbara because uh, they're a pair. And uh, it was a wonderful day of celebration. But I've got to tell you, our teams, our usher teams, worked really hard yesterday. And our hospitality teams at served the lunch, did a marvelous job, and our tech team on sound and media. I was so proud of our people that worked so hard with such a great spirit. Just love in everything that they did yesterday that I, I just can't tell you how much I appreciate and how thankful I am for this church family and for all of those of you who serve. It really made for a very special day yesterday. Now, the average age probably yesterday at the service was 65 or 70. And I had one sermon prepared, but as I just looked out on the congregation and the demographics, uh, I really felt that the Holy Spirit was leading me a, di a different direction. And so I shared with them what... Gene's future is in Christ. And I took them to the passage that we're going to study in detail this morning. Because unfortunately, even many people who have even grown up in the Christian church have not been taught really what lies beyond the grave. They have, particularly this passage, has not been taught in many churches or not been taught well or accurately. And I wanted these people to at least once in their lives hear what God's word says on the matter of the future life for Christians. And so we're going to dive into 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 13 through 18 this morning. Now you might say, Pastor Paul, we haven't covered verses 1 through 12. Well, that's because that's about sex. <laughs> and no, I'm not afraid to address sex. But our youth are on a, their annual snow trip, and so our youth are not here. And I believe it's important that our youth hear from the pulpit of the church... A godly biblical truth about our sexuality, which is positive, though many who think Christianity paints a negative on human sexuality. It's just the opposite. Our God created us as sexual beings, 
And so our young people need to hear that. And so that's why we're jumping to 13 through 18. Will you forgive me for that? Can we handle that as a church family? I'm sure we can. Now, as we come, and, and, and Andy, we're flying together here. I forgot to get the clicker, so you're my clicker. So if you'll take us to the next slide. This morning, we're going to study together uh, what the Scripture teaches is the how and the why, or the how and when, Christians will be resurrected. Now, as we've been studying through 1 Thessalonians, some of you have been noticing how often the Apostle Paul refers to the future. For instance, in this case, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, he wrote, How you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. And so he is talking about their reputation in the region of Macedonia. And they were once idolaters, but now they have turned to the one true God, Yahweh of the Bible. And they are awaiting the coming of Jesus, the one who has risen from the dead. And that's a very important theme and he's the one who delivers us from the wrath to come. And so very future looking. But that's not all. In, in the second chapter, verse 19, we studied this last week. When Paul is uh, talking about his love for the Thessalonians, he says, For what is our hope or joy or crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus at his coming? And there he's referring not only to the coming of the Lord Jesus, but what happens after. And that is the judgment seat of Christ, where he will reward his faithful servants. And so again, forward looking in chapter three, verse 13, we read so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and father. At the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. Now you'll see today, particularly this last one, how it fits with what we're going to read in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. Now it seems that you remember Timothy came back from Thessalonica with the report that the, the young believers in the Thessalonian church were thriving. But they also had questions that they gave Timothy to ask Paul. And this is one of the reasons why Paul wrote the letter. Now, it's obvious that when he was there, in the short time he was there, Paul taught a lot. And one of the topics that he taught a lot was about the future. But he didn't cover this particular issue that we will see this morning contained in verses 13 through 18. And that is. It seems that. There were believers in the Thessalonian church. Who had died. And the believers were concerned. That their loved ones who had died. Would be left out. Of all of the things that will happen. When Jesus comes a second time. Now when Jesus comes a second time. To the earth. To establish his kingdom on the earth. The scriptures tell us. That believers will serve in his kingdom. And they were thinking that it would be the believers who were alive. At the time of Jesus' coming. Who would serve. And that perhaps the believers who had already died. Would miss out. And so Paul explains. That that's not the case. Let's. Read this passage, a well-known passage to many of us, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, beginning with verse 13. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, literally ignorant. We do not want you to be ignorant, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. 
For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Now, though this passage may be very familiar to many of us, I want to slow down and take a little bit of a deep dive as we look and we work through it verse by verse. Let's go back to verse 13. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. When he says those who are asleep, he's referring to Christians who have died. He's not teaching soul sleep, that when you die, you go to sleep, and then when you wake up, uh, you're in heaven or whatever the theology says. He's not, he is using what's called a metaphor, uh, what's called a, a euphemism. He's using a gentler way of speaking about a hard thing. And so those who have died, those believers who have died, they are those who have fallen asleep. And it's a great metaphor, by the way, because when you're asleep, you're still very much alive. Would you agree? Okay. And so these believers have died, but they're still very much alive. And what Paul now shares is going to bring the Thessalonians who are grieving over their uh, loved ones who have passed. It's going to bring them great hope. Now we look at verse 14. This is very important. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. So what we need to understand here in 14 is Paul is setting the foundation for our belief in the resurrection of Christians in this manner. And it's anchored in the literal historical, physical resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth on April 5th, 33 AD. You see, we're very honest as Christians, and we know that our faith stands or falls on the historical fact of the resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth from the dead. That cannot be a myth that cannot be a lofty religious idea that has no basis in time and space. If that is the case and Jesus did not literally physically rise from the dead, then Christianity is false and goes away. And we should go back to Judaism to await the coming of the Messiah. And so, and so Paul very rightly anchors what he teaches here on the historical, physical, literal fact of the resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth from the dead. That's why it's really important that you take that issue seriously and that you study the evidence for it so that you're convinced, not because I've said it, not because others have said it, but because you've looked at the evidence and you are convinced. Here's some of the evidence. On the day that Jesus was resurrected, his tomb was found to be empty, though it had been guarded by a contingent of Roman soldiers for whom the loss of that body would be the loss of their lives. The tomb was empty. Jesus on that day alone was seen by 15 eyewitnesses. If you're in the court of law presenting proof of your position and you have 15 eyewitnesses, do you have a strong case? 
You have an extremely strong case. It's also not understood by many believers, but you need to understand this. Jesus then lived with his disciples for 40 days in the area of Galilee, in Capernaum, where he had ministered. He was with them for 40 days. They interacted with the resurrected Jesus for 40 days. A month and 10 days. They lived He continued to teach them and to prepare them to carry on the work of his ministry after he ascended to the Father. On one occasion during that 40 days, he was seen by over 500 men, not including women and children. And then you have the issue of the Apostle Paul. Before he was the Apostle Paul, what was his Hebrew name? Saul. And he was the arch enemy of Jesus Christ, hated Jesus, hated those who believed in him. He set out to persecute and to to destroy the church. He had people murdered who were followers of Jesus Christ until he encountered the resurrected Jesus in Damascus and his life was completely transformed. And he went on to be used by God to reach the Roman Empire with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it cost him greatly. And he suffered much until he was taken home. You see, these are the evidences that cause us to be confident that Jesus of Nazareth died and rose again, as Paul establishes here. Because if he didn't, then we have no hope. Of being resurrected. Do we understand that? It is founded upon the resurrection of Jesus Christ. From the dead. And so Paul says in 14. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again. And the next phrase. Looks like a nothing burger in English. Even so. But it is key to understanding the verse. What Paul is saying is. In like manner. In a similar way. And then. He's saying. That God will resurrect believers. That's his point. He says just as God resurrected Jesus. So also. Similarly. Likewise. God is going to rec- uh, going to resurrect believers. He says. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again. Likewise, even so, in in a similar manner, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. He's saying what follows is how God is going to resurrect you. Followers of Jesus Christ, believers in Jesus Christ. Here is how it's going to happen. And he says, God will bring with him, the him there is Jesus, those who have fallen asleep. And so what you need to understand is, The Bible teaches us that when a believer dies, their soul goes to be with the Lord in the third heaven, the dwelling place of God. And so this indicates that Jesus now, at the time when God is going to resurrect Christians, is going to be on the move. And Jesus is going to be moving, and when he moves, who is with him? Look at the text. Who is with Jesus when he's on the move? The souls of all those who have fallen asleep. The souls of all church age believers. Of church age believers. Because the church born on Pentecost 33 AD is the bride of Christ. And so all Christians who have died since Pentecost 33 AD until the moment of this event. Their souls have been with Jesus in the third heaven. We get that? When God tells Jesus, go get your bride. All of those souls will come back with Jesus from the third heaven. Into the atmosphere of the earth, what's called the first heaven. Okay, we've got to get that clear in our minds. And it's going to be reinforced as we continue on. As we look at verse 15. 
For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord. Paul is saying that it was Jesus who revealed to him how and when Christians are going to be resurrected. He came directly from the Lord Jesus that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. So what that indicates is that there is an order. That those who have fallen asleep will be the first to be resurrected. And as we'll see in just a moment, the first to be gathered up, followed by those who are alive at the time of this resurrection. Now we go on to verse 16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. Now that's a mouthful. Sometimes we get lost in all those words. Let me do it this way. Let me story it for you. My father, who died in 2011, was a follower of Jesus Christ. His soul went to be with the Lord Jesus Christ in heaven. So my father's soul and my mother's souls are both there in the third heaven with Jesus. Let's say tomorrow is when God the Father has determined to resurrect Christians. Tomorrow is the day that he sends his son to gather his bride out of the earth. Are you with me? Tomorrow, Monday, March 4th. Okay, midnight is the step off time. God looks to the son and says, son, here's all your believers that have already died. You take them and you go. And so Jesus goes, he comes from heaven. He has the souls of my mother and father. And you can fill in the blank for your loved ones who are followers of Jesus Christ, who are in that throng. And let me stop here. It's not only the souls of those who have fallen asleep in Christ, but did you see the mention of an archangel? An archangel is a ruling angel. Jesus is going to give the command as he comes into the atmosphere of the earth. He's going to give the command and that command is going to be repeated by the archangel to whom? Who, who are in a position to obey the command of an archangel? Fellow angels. The angelic host. And I believe the angelic host, our guardian angels will be with that throng who comes back. And the trumpet call of God is the way that ancient warfare was carried out. And it directed the troops in their movements. This is an invasion. Because who's presently the God of this world? Who presently is the prince of the power of the air? Satan is. And so Jesus is mounting what? An invasion. And coming with him are the angelic hosts. Our guardian angels. And the souls of all the Christians who have died since 33, uh, Pentecost 33 AD. And then Jesus is going to give the command to his angels. I believe. I've come to believe this. And that the angels will somehow... Be a part of the resurrection, the souls coming back and being reunited with a resurrection body and being gathered up to meet the Lord in the air. And then if we are alive after my mom and dad has received their resurrection body and they are taken up by the angels to meet the Lord and I'm still alive. 
then this body will be what we call translated. I will receive a resurrection body without having to go through the process of physical death. If you're alive tomorrow, and I hope you are, you too will be translated. You will receive your resurrection body, but only after the dead in Christ have received their resurrection bodies and been gathered up. And once you have received your resurrection body, you too will be gathered up. And as I think about this, and I'm not going to die on this hill, and, and please come back, your, your pastor is not getting like super goofy, but I think it's the angels who gather us and enable us to be gathered to the Lord in the air. Because you see, Jesus, because he's resurrected, he's limited in time and space. Do you understand that? When he comes to the atmosphere, he's going to be at a certain point. He's going to be somewhere because he's in his physical body. Do you get that? He's not going to be everywhere present throughout the whole earth. He's going to be at one place. Now, if he is over America, let's say, at, you know, nationalism here, and you're a believer in Russia, how are you going to know the way to get to Jesus? How are you going to know where he is? Who's going to guide you? The angels are going to bring us to Jesus. And we're going to be gathered to him and then... He is going to take us to the third heaven where we have the judgment seat of Christ. We're purified. We're rewarded. We're prepared for going into his kingdom. And on earth then will be that terrible time that Paul refers to as the wrath. The day of the Lord. That Jesus will deliver us from. That's our future. It doesn't get any better than that. And so you can see how even as we grieve the loss of the ones that we love so much, we grieve, but we have this burning hope in us of the resurrection. Now, here's my concern for most of us. Right now, what I have said to you are a bunch of words. They're just a bunch of words. Maybe even when you read it in the Bible, it's just a bunch of words. And you know what? As long as this remains a bunch of words, it has very little impact on your life or mine. It has very little impact. It's the kind of stuff that we can forget really easily. The power comes when we upload it into our imagination. And we picture it in our mind as best as we can. And that's when that truth really comes home and has transformative power in our lives is when we meditate on it and we load it into our imagination and we just picture that day. That's when it has power to transform our lives. And I've seen it. The believers who have really thought a lot about this and who have pictured it in their minds are the ones who really, when they're grieving the loss of their loved ones, really do it with hope. Because it becomes so real. Now again, it sounds like a fairy tale, doesn't it? It just sounds crazy. But wait a minute. We believe that Jesus came back from the dead. If there's anything crazy, it's the idea of a resurrection of a man who was dead, 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 dead. Coming back to life. But he did. Not a problem for God the Father. If he can raise Jesus Christ from the dead. Can he raise us in this manner? As Paul lays out. That Jesus revealed to him. This is the how and when. Of our resurrection. Not a problem. For our God. And you know what else is really fascinating to me? I think we have this idea that this is all going to be done in secret. It's not going to be done in secret. The whole world is going to witness the resurrection of Christians. The whole world is going to see it. We don't all of a sudden go invisible. 
And I don't know exactly what that looks like. I don't know if there's going to be holes in the ground in our cemeteries where those resurrected believers come out of the ground. But they're definitely going to see us being gathered in the air to meet the Lord in the atmosphere. The whole world is going to see it. And what do you think they're going to do with that? Well, I think it's going to lead to many people coming to faith in Jesus Christ that you have witnessed to. Because they're going to remember you're telling them about this. Or they're going to remember videos that they have watched teaching these truths. And I think there's going to be people who are going to come to faith. But then I think there's going to be other people that it hardens their hearts. Why is it? This is interesting. Why is it that as we go farther and farther in our history, there's more and more interest in UFOs? And more and more legitimacy being given to UFOs. That's very that's a very fascinating correlation, I think. Is that going to be one of the means by which the world explains away this catastrophic event of our resurrection? There's going to have to be a way that mankind can be deceived. But it's a fascinating thing to think to think about. Oh, I could go on and on and on, but we want to celebrate Jesus through communion today. And I'm going to invite Nate to come up at this time and lead us in worship because it's the Lord Jesus Christ who makes all this possible, right? His blood shed on the cross for us. His death and his resurrection on the third day. Man, do it, Nate. (laughs) All right, well, good morning. Um, It was fun to celebrate communion with you, and especially after that. Uh, On on the night Jesus was betrayed, he was at the Last Supper. He was having a Last Supper with his disciples. And it wasn't just... Uh, his last dinner before the cross, uh, he was actually celebrating a Seder dinner. He was having a Seder dinner. He was celebrating and remembering the Passover. If you've ever read the events or the story of the Passover, you can, you can read them in the book of Exodus, but it's an amazing story. The story where the Israelites had been slaves for almost 400 years in Egypt, been under an, an oppressive ruler, and then God in his Uh, Power and might and wisdom and control over all things steps into human history and he he breaks them free and he he busts them out of Egypt. It's a great reversal of of fortunes where you have uh, a nation, a group of people, the Israelites, who had nothing. No king, no inheritance, no land. They were slaves. And then all of a sudden, God breaks them out and there are people with land There are people with inheritance, and there are people with God as their king. It's an amazing story. And so God commanded the Jewish people to celebrate this event every year. They were to celebrate it, and they were to remember. They were to remember the things that God had done on their behalf, because remembering is important. Remembering is important. By remembering, they could rightly express their gratitude to God for what he'd done for them. To rightly express that thankfulness, that gratitude, the way that he had saved them, the way he had rescued them. And then by remembering, they could orient their thoughts and the actions uh, that they had on a daily basis to this wonderful fact that God had chosen them. He had rescued them. He had given them things. He had put them in a land and he had given them a responsibility. They were to be a light to the nations. They had purpose. And so by remembering what God had done, it helped to orient their, their daily lives. This is what you should do. And then finally, as, as Paul talked, it's the same thing. He gave them, it gave them great hope for the future. That what God had promised and then done, that those things that had been promised and not yet happened, that they would be done. In the same way that God proved his miraculous power here, in the future, it would happen again. And so the Israelites had great Hope, remembering what he had done for them, gave them great, great hope. And so, remembering is so important. So important. And while Jesus was there with his disciples at that last 
supper, at that Seder dinner, at the Passover dinner, and he was remembering what God had done on behalf of the Israelites. He was doing that, celebrating. But then he also instituted a new ritual, a new thing that the Israelites, not the Israelites, but that all those who put their faith in him as Messiah were to do in the future for generations and generations to come, that they were to institute this new communion, we call it. And those who believed and have put their faith in Jesus as the Messiah were to gather together, like we are this morning, they're to break bread, to drink a cup of wine, grape juice. In the Philippines, when we were missionaries there, we would drink tang and sky flakes. But they were to gather together, and the important part wasn't necessarily what you were doing, but it was the remembering, remembering what God had done. And so Jesus commanded us, his future disciples, to do the same, to remember what he did on our behalf. Because remembering also helps us express our gratitude to Jesus for what he did on our behalf on the cross. And then it helps us to orient our lives today to the reality because of his death and resurrection, because of, of who we are. Right? We're chosen. We're given gifts. We're brought into a family. Right? We're free. We're saved because of what Jesus did on our behalf. And then we have purpose, right? We're a light in darkness. We're salt. And so it gives us a purpose for today. But then, as Paul talked again, it gives us great hope for the future. That what God has done through Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus, gives us great hope that that same resurrection will happen with us. And I was just privileged to be here uh, yesterday as we celebrated Gene's memorial. Right? And there was a room, and there was sadness in this room. But it wasn't sadness without hope. It was sadness because we won't see Gene for a time. But it was filled with great hope because we know, because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that we will see Gene again one day. And that we too, those who have put our faith in Jesus, will be resurrected. And that gives us great hope. And so that's why we remember today. We remember those things. And so as we take communion together, let's obey our Messiah Jesus and remember what God has done on our behalf. And let's thank Him. Let's take time to let it orient our lives today for the purpose which He placed us here. And then let the hope sink in as well, the hope for the future, that death isn't the end, that Jesus was resurrected. And so we will be resurrected, and that gives us great hope. And so if you're new with us uh, and you've never taken communion with us, we invite anyone who would like to take communion to take it. Uh, we don't have any restrictions on it. We'd even, if you maybe haven't put your faith in Jesus, we would invite you to take communion. What greater uh, thing could you do this morning than to take a moment and to think about what Jesus has done on your behalf? To take time and to ponder that. And if you haven't put your faith in him as the one to make things right between you and God, that you do it this morning. I think that would be a great, that's uh, no other way to honor Jesus than to do that. So I invite you to, to take that with us this morning. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we love you and we just do thank you for all the things that you've done. We thank you for your body that was broken and for your blood that was shed. We thank you that for the, the resurrection that happened. We thank you for the peace that we have now because of you. We ask that we, would, that we take these, um, the, the cracker and we take the, the cup that we would remember that. And we love you. And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it, to other, gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. This is the cup that is poured out for you, is the new covenant in my blood. Heavenly Father, we love you, and we just do, again, thank you for your body and your blood that was broken and shed on our behalf. And we love you, and we thank you for it. In your name, amen.